Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Detroit. I am Sharnita Johnson, and I am the Arts Program Director for the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation in New Jersey, but I am a proud native Detroiter. <laughs> and thrilled to be home, and thrilled to be uh, moderating this fantastic panel with my wonderful colleagues. And I'm gonna let them um, introduce themselves, their name, their organization, um, and I wanna start with Susan. I'm Susan Fader, I'm Program Officer in the Arts and Cultural Heritage Program of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in New York. I'm Todd Nissen, I am uh, the Global Volunteer Corps Director and Communications Director for the Ford Motor Company Fund here in Detroit, and uh, really glad to be sharing the uh, stage with a long distant cousin mm. of an organization. Good morning, I'm Kevin Ryan, I'm the Detroit Program Officer for the Ford Foundation. Fantastic. So we are going to be talking today um, around about funders and inclusion and accountability. All really big words, right? All really interesting words. Words that don't always sort of meld together. Um, but we want to have a real frank conversation um, about, and, and I'm going to actually put this in the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, some funders are at the diversity Point, some are at the inclusion point and some are at the equity point. Um, but what I really would like to do is for everyone to hear what each of the funders are, um, what they're focused on, what their priorities are, and how they are sort of working in this space. And I want to start with Susan, um, ladies' choice, mm -hmm. and uh, talk about the work that's happening at Mellon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mellon, of course, is a national funder. Uh, we have assets uh, about six and a half billion dollars, and we fund exclusively in the arts and humanities, which makes us unusual among our peer organizations. Um, the arts and cultural heritage budget is $65 million annually. It ranges across the performing arts, art history conservation in museums, professional development, capitalization, uh, and multidisciplinary work. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as an um, incubator, a catalyzer, sometimes a midwife uh, on large-scale initiatives. We make multi-year grants. They are by invitation only. And um, I think a lot of people in this room are here to wonder what the secret handshake is. <laughs> so I'll give you a big, brief peek under the hood of uh, what we are doing um, at the Mellon Foundation these days, particularly in arts and cultural heritage and particularly in our music program, uh, grant making. All right, let's try it. Hello, there we go, sorry. So, um, it's not here, okay. Uh, we begin with commitment. In 2014, we articulated in our very first strategic plan for a 47-year-old organization, the foundation endeavors to strengthen, promote, and where necessary, defend the contributions of the humanities and the arts to human flourishing, and to the well-being of diverse and democratic societies. To that, we overlaid what we called cross-cutting foci. There's some funders speak for you. One of those was diversity and inclusion. And you'll note it's not diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's a battle I lost and continue to argue for. Then we take inspiration. Uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has had a program called the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program uh, which seeks to place college-age students interested in career, academic careers in the humanities and provide a support system for them through their graduate years. It's a 30-year commitment. There are 48 member schools and three consortia. And as of 2017, there are 5,000-plus student fellows. Uh, this is a typo. It's 700-plus have earned the PhD. Uh, and the majority of them are, uh, have an appointment in the academy, and we're talking about presidents of colleges, we're talking about um, uh, provosts, academics, uh, 100 plus tenured faculty members. Now, I find this program uh, inspiring, particularly because if you looked at the trajectory of that program over 10 years, it started at ground level, and then it moved like this. And if we had declared victory at the tenure point, we could have. But in going to 30 years, the trajectory now looks like this. 
And there's a steady state of students getting a PhD and getting placed every year. And when I think about the music field and particularly orchestras, I think we are looking at generational change. Uh, this was a $100 million investment over those 30 years. Uh, so if you divide that by 30, it's not astronomical on a year-by-year -year basis, but it was a great investment. Uh, when we initiate a new program, we begin with research. Uh, we uh, worked with the League of American Orchestras on these two programs uh, the last couple of years, and important pieces of research that I commend to anyone that's interested in this work. We then think about capacity building, and I'm going to um, just run you quickly through our comprehensive organizational health initiative, which we launched in 2014 as an, as an example of large-scale systemic opportunity for change. This is a three-phase program that begins with landscape review, goes on into tailored um, uh, financial uh, support for a select number of institutions with uh, recovery capital, general operating support, uh, and um, working capital, and then moves into change capital grants that are awarded direct from the foundation. Uh, we have three cohorts currently. We started with art conservation service organizations, and then the National Performance Network Visual Arts Network, uh, which is a wonderful uh, consortium of about 60 members, many of whom are working in rural areas, uh, culturally specific areas, or community organizing. And our most recent cohort is the International Association of Blacks and Dance. This is an eight-year uh, initiative. We estimate a, estimate a cost of about 26 million. Moving into music and some of the arts and cultural heritage music initiatives, um, the foundation uh, is comfortable in the areas to the middle and the right, uh, higher education, professional development. Uh, with music, as all of you know all too well, if we don't start early, we can't capture the talent that exists. So we have moved in the last couple of years into some very selective pre-college training programs, identifying, however, the uh, refinement and pre-professional training, the kids that like to practice and think they want to become musicians. Um, I, we believe, I believe personally, firmly in access programs, but this is not the way our foundation works, and I must work in the culture of our foundation, and I want to note that. So some of the programs we have started, this is um, National Youth Orchestra 2 at Carnegie Hall, the photo, but this is the Philadelphia Music Alliance for Youth, which is 10 organizations in Philadelphia that have come together collectively and want to move students of talent through this um, period of um, access opportunity, and we're providing um, things like private lessons, um, scholarships to summer programs, college counseling, et cetera. Uh, Project at Celerando at the National Symphony is another program we're supporting, NYO2 at Carnegie Hall. And then more professional development programs. We learn by listening, so we are in the room at convenings like Things Connect, um, like the League of American Orchestras. Um, I think Jesse ref has referenced several times the Mellon League convening in December where we brought together, unlike parties in the orchestra field, including youth orchestras, LC STEMA programs, uh, college conservatories, and the... And the uh, professional orchestras themselves, many of you here uh, contributed to our listening and learning, and take stock of the field, find out where Mellon can intervene to be helpful. Uh, we have a series of fellowship programs we have uh, 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 supported over the years, including these, I won't list the names, Gateway Music Festival is a recent grantee, and then the le latest big project is our National Alliance for Audition Support, uh, which is through a grant to Sphinx, and is a collaboration with Sphinx, the League, the New World Symphony, um, college and conservatories, uh, and orchestra field. And Alpha talked about that yesterday afternoon, and I believe we'll be speaking about it further today. So that's a range of some of the programs that we are thinking about and how we think. Thank you, Susan. What I appreciate about your work is that it's intentional, it's thoughtful, and it's sequential. Mm -hmm. And those are things that are really, really important in this work. You must be intentional about it. And think long term. And long term, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so Kevin, I'm going to be your official Detroit welcome wagon. <laughs> so welcome to Detroit. And tell us about what you're doing at Ford. Thank you. Um, well, I, I wanted to start today by just defining how we see inclusion. And then I'm, I'll work quickly to what we're doing in Detroit. But we're really defining inclusion by cultural shift and thinking about 
how all people, regardless of race or gender or ability, uh, can participate and are heard in any kind of change process from the beginning of that process all the way through that process. And that we use this as an overlying strategy for all of the work we do. We actually have seven different thematic areas um, from inclusive economies to internet freedom. And for today's conversation, uh, fr creative and free expression, which is where our arts and culture work lies. And for us, we're really trying to figure out how arts and culture can really dig and address and expose the root causes of injustices. And we're also trying to figure out how we can, through supporting storytellers and artists and others, we can really lift up the voices and stories of communities who have long been left out of these discussions around the injustices that communities face. And then we're also looking at how we can shift the narrative and place around the world, how we can actually drive different stories about how communities are shaped, how communities are built, and how communities uh, thrive in, in the future. So that brings me to the Detroit work. In Detroit, we, we're focused on um, affordable housing and land use issues in the city, but we also have a big component of it that's about cultural shift in Detroit. Uh, a lot of you uh, may have heard various stories about the recovery in the city. Uh, some voices have gotten more press than others. Uh, there are voices that we feel have been left out for many years, people who have really uh, worked hard to keep their communities thriving through all of the challenges Detroit has faced and are not being recognized for that work and recognized for their vision of the future of the city. So our arts and culture work here is partially about diversity and ensuring that those voices are at the table, that they're able to participate in curating exhibits at some of the, the major museums in the city, that those voices in communities, artists who, who have told their stories in various mediums get more exposure, and that we also wanna make sure that, we're, that artists are connected to the thinking about the future city of Detroit, meaning how are artists connected into conversations about community development? How are artists connected in with designers and with um, urban planners to think about and how communities look in the future for the city of Detroit? And also how artists can contribute to conversations about some of the policy issues and the, the systemic issues that affect the city. So if we're talking about affordable housing in the city of Detroit, and we're talking about today some of the disparities about the type of housing that's being built at certain income levels, and then the type of housing that's actually necessary to house a city that still has a, a poverty rate of 40%, artists need to be an integral part of those conversations through their performances, but also through their voices. So we're really trying to be as inclusive as possible when we identify where those transformations and changes can happen. And we're constantly um, reviewing and examining our positions on diversity, on inclusion, and on equity. And one example of this, um, we recently, in, in examining where we were, realized that we were not doing enough to address the issues of disability. So we have actually gone through an internal process to actually ramp up our support for disability rights and to support work in, in the city that really translates to bringing that um, at, at the same level and in the same conversation with racial equity, with gender equity, and some of the other challenges that we face. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, mm -hmm. and I have to correct myself. I'm welcoming you home. Oh, thank you, okay, <laughs> thank you. All right. Native yeah. Detroit, too. <laughs> um, so Todd, can we hear from you talking about um, what the Ford Fund is doing? Sure, thank you. Um, so the fund is the philanthropic arm of the Ford Motor Company. It was started in 1949, and now we're focused sort of broadly in four areas, education, community, community life, uh, volunteering, and what we call safe, smart mobility. Um, I would say that it's interesting. So inclusion is something that, that goes all the way back to the company's history in, in the sense of the $5 a day wage. And that really that was a way of including various populations, various immigrants, others in the company's workforce. Uh, so there's a sense of inclusion and diversity that goes all the way back to the, to the company's history. Um, in the arts and culture space in particular, what we're really focused on is access. We work with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. I see some colleagues here, uh, Jesse from the League. Um, 
access to different populations all the time. Um, we were, were proud to be a sponsor of the DSO's trip to Asia this last summer. Uh, and that was a huge exposure, not just for the city, not just for the orchestra, but for our own employees. And it's important for them to see how really our role stretches into all this. One of the um, programs that we have with the league is promoting the community work that musicians do. And we've got a, um, an award uh, program that recognizes musicians for the work that they do really at the grassroots level. Um, and that, that's been real successful in sort of promoting the arts and a sense of how it connects everything. Um, something that we're really starting to think about, and, I, and, it, and it's sort of, we're encouraging our partners to think about, is what is diversity? If we look at where populations are going, by 2040, the minority majority concept, uh, it's something that a diverse population will be our population. And if we look at even issues like hunger relief, um, um, other things that, that ways that we touch communities is one and the same as diversity and inclusion. So we're, we're trying to be a conduit for those sort of things and engage our partners to think about diversity and inclusion not just as a separate topic, but something that is the topic. Thank you. And I want to remind our audience that we will leave ample time for questions. So if you have a question and you're in the room, we have mics set up. And also, to um, if you want to um, enter an online question, go to slido.com and use the hashtag SphinxConnect. Um, and so um, we've heard a lot about what all of you are doing individually and in your institutions around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But really, the conversation, um, I think, we want to go a little bit deeper and talk about um, what's happening in the field. And so I'll talk a little bit about the Dodge Foundation. Um, so the Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge Foundation is um, centered in New Jersey, and I have a statewide portfolio of um, primarily performing and visual arts organizations. And New Jersey is, is one of the most diverse states in the country. Um, however, when you really look at the types of organizations that um, are in the portfolio, they're not reflective. And so we really started to have a serious conversation about three years ago when I joined the foundation um, around what does that look like? Um, how did we get to this place? How do we understand what barriers are? And, and how do we start to really bring what we call a line of organizations? And Susan and I are both on the Grant Makers in the Arts um, Board, which is a national um, association of arts funders. And they have, we have an equity statement, and really part of that work is to really start to shift the balance of, of how we support a line of organizations and bring them into the fold. Um, and so uh, as we started to really have these conversations internally at Dodge, we sort of had to look at, you know, we have an online application process. You have to have an audit. You have to have a 501c3. And some of those can be barriers to um, a line of organizations or small nonprofits. And so we're really thinking about um, how we change some of those practices. And that's just a, a sort of simple example of kind of what we're doing. And, and the conversations internally, trust me, are very, um, very interesting, um, sometimes challenging, um, but I really appreciate that we, are, we have the space that we can really talk about these issues because as Todd mentioned, the, the landscape in the country really has changed. It's, it's certainly changing, but it's changed. And we want to be able to sort of reflect that. And as funders, we're in a unique position to advance that. So I'd like to get an opinion from um, the panel. What are you thinking about um, how foundations, what their role is, what can we do and should we do with the platform that we have to really talk about this issue? Susan? Um, you're right, we have a wonderful platform, um, but I think that we can, as I said earlier, be a catalyzer, um, an initiator, uh, but um, we have to be working with a coalition of the w willing. I don't think this is um, work that we can force on anyone that doesn't want to be in this area. Uh, we talk a lot about authenticity when we meet with uh, potential grantees, and are they walking the walk uh, and needing financial support to uh, realize their visions, or are they simply reading our website and seeking funding? And it is easy to sort out the wheat from the chaff. 
uh, but this work cannot be forced down throats. Um, I can make as much of an impact on whom I'm not funding as whom I am funding. Thank you. Pat? Um, I would say, similar to that, making connections. Um, taking groups that not, are not necessarily talking to each other and putting them in a room, putting lots of them in a room, and asking them to think differently. Uh, it's really something that, and where we sit as a, as a motor company, we touch a lot of different organizations, education organizations, city organizations, certainly nonprofits. And uh, our role, really, I see is, is just to be a conduit. Uh, and sometimes that does mean having some tough conversations. If you have similar groups who are somewhat in competing areas, um, you know, do you, do you find different spots that you can occupy? Um, so it's, I think being a convener is a role that we can play. Um, and just because of the broad view that we have across various communities, um, we, uh, and this is on us, is to see places where those connections can be made and that aren't necessarily obvious. Wow, see, we, this, <laughs> this question is always one that I really struggle with because um, some of the dynamics that address equity, inclusion, and diversity um, are, we ask our grantees and we ask groups to actually model that in the field, but we don't often practice that ourselves. And I I'm always, always struggle with this because I see some really great examples of community foundations who are really trying to model this. Uh, I know uh, when I was in New York and I worked for uh, the New York Foundation in, in New York City, we had a chance to visit groups of, of funders across the state, particularly community foundations in Buffalo, in Rochester, and in Brooklyn that were really trying to take those values around um, diversity and equity and inclusion and incorporate them. So how do we choose board members that reflect the diversity that we want? How do we actually choose staff members and train staff members and board members so that they understand what we mean by equity and inclusion and, we're, and they're getting out in the field and discussing this with other funders? So I think there are ways to do it that are grant making ways to do it, but there's also us getting in the practice of, of doing that in our institutions. I know it's difficult, it's not an easy process. And you could talk to any of those community foundations and they'll tell you the difficulties and challenges of that. But I think until we actually get to the point where we take that seriously at our internal, internally, it's gonna be very challenging for us to reflect that in the field. You make a very excellent point, actually. And I think that that is certainly something that we are talking about in the field. Um, and in terms of thinking about how we can support the grantee community, because to your point, Susan, it's more of a carrot than a stick. Right. Um, and, and we're certainly thinking about that at Dodge. How do we work with our grantees to help them sort of understand, in, in a, a lot of ways, structural racism? Um, which you may not make the direct corollary, however, it's, it's a very important conversation and, and looking at all levels of operations of organizations. So I think you make a really excellent point. Shawnee, I just want to add, um, we can also ask questions. And uh, we, and all of our proposals now ask about uh, the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some of the responses are sometimes anodyne, to be frank. Um, but it can lead to other questions. If someone says there are no people of color on their boards, we can call that to question. But it's also, we have it in our proposals because sometimes there's not in institutional alignment within our grantee organization that a staff may be ahead of a board uh, in wanting to effectuate change. And by putting those in our proposal, we think that we can give some ballast to um, the executive leadership and can take it to the board and say, the Mellon Foundation is asking these questions. How are we going to answer them? And we hope to um, inspire internal conversation there also. Our uh, museums program a couple of years ago did a large scale survey of the museum field about their staff and board um, uh, constitution, which has engendered numerous conversations throughout the museum field and provided a baseline of data that uh, that that program is now building on. So again, as a researcher, we can also be helpful. I was gonna say, I think it's helpful also for us to maybe help you define what you're doing and, and sort of provide qualitative and quantitative results, because um, nothing speaks like numbers and impact. And the more that I think we can help 
articulate what the impact is, even though it's subjective. Um, there's ways that you can put numbers around it. And in the world we live in, in data, uh, and especially in an organization like ours, if we can show the impact um, uh, that an arts organization is having, that is huge. Um, I mean, we're, uh, we get our funding from people who run a motor company. They're used to seeing um, numbers and results, and, and, and we can translate that, but the more that we can help you uh, define what you're doing and the impact that you're doing, uh, I think, and that's, that is on us, uh, then we all win. Great, so this is actually a really good segue to my next question, which is, as a field, we learn from one another, um, we cite each other for um, purposes, so for example, um, when I'm, when I was starting to broach this conversation with internally and with my board, I cited a lot of the work that Ford was doing. I cited a lot of work that Mellon was doing. I cited a lot of work that was happening in the field to say, you know, we're really, we need to sort of get with the program in many ways. And if your peers are showing examples, concrete examples that you can demonstrate, it's really, really helpful. So I wanted to ask, um, where are you seeing outside of your own organization or even your own organization promise, best practice? Um, are there particular studies or organizations that you cite in, in your work in trying to bring move this work forward? Um, I would start with Holly Sidford's work, um, her 2011 report, Seizing Art, Culture, and Social Change, um, and the follow-up, which I can't remember the it's name of. It's not just the money. It's not just the money. Yeah. Um, uh, that was very impactful in my own thinking. Uh, uh, so we do try to be a both and rather than an either or funder. Um, I actually take issue with some of Holly's more recent, um, the more recent study, uh, as much as I admire it. Her data is, li is limited at, at, to 2014, and I think this is work that is changing constantly among the funding community. Um, and uh, she worked with the Foundation Center, so that's only grants of above $10,000, and I think there's a lot of small-scale work going with small-scale organizations. Um, but again, um, uh, uh, Trinita cited the grant makers in the arts, and we convene three, four times a year, and we do talk to each other, and we get inspiration. And yeah, more inspiration was to start a sphinx. <laughs> so, and it's taken 20 years to get to this moment. Todd, did you want to comment on that? Well, I, was, I would actually um, lend a compliment to, to the Ford Foundation and the, and the storytelling that you do, uh, and the ways that you um, frame issues and get it out. I, I read uh, the letters and I personally find that that's helpful um, to sort of see how a different organization frames issues. So, thank you. I had nothing to do with it, so I'm good with it. I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, I, I mentioned the community foundations. I, I really admire the fact that, because I, I think community foundations have a very challenging job of trying to address equity and inclusion. Uh, because they, they're involved in funding so many different areas of work. So the Community Foundation I mentioned earlier, I really admire the work they do. And then since I've been in Detroit, I, I really have found, um, and I'm not just saying this because they, they let me have an office in their space, but Kellogg Foundation I think really does a fantastic job of lifting the issues, particularly on racial equity. And we have some partnerships that we're moving forward that I'm really excited about. And then, and then I'm, also, I'm also really interested in how we can, um, because I, I don't want to leave out the Council of Foundations in various states who really play a role in convening us and connecting us so that we can have deeper conversations around particular issues. I know the Council has been really big on the census issue, which I think is a, a, another one of those issues where when we think about the census 2020 and the importance of that and how that will determine resource allocation and other issues, um, this is another place where I think arts and culture and artists have to play a big role in that. So I'm, I'm really encouraged that the, the council and other groups around the state are actually thinking about how to be inclusive in the outreach and also who the, the outreach um, leaders and, and organizers are to really connect people. So that, to me, there's, a, there's some underlying pieces to that. And I, I, I don't want to, I mean, you didn't want us to be honest. So I'm going to throw one other thing out. And I think there's so much great stuff that's happening out here and we're not always able to connect to it because we're, we're all very busy and there's a lot of things going on. I think if there were spaces where we could share um, some of those best practices, particularly from 
the national foundations to the local foundations, because I think there are some dynamics there that can be difficult to navigate. I think we will actually be able to create better on the ground grant making strategies for ourselves. So I think that's an area where I think some interesting things are happening to align national and local work, and but we still have some more work to do there. Great. So we have a very popular question from Slido. Um, why did the Mellon Foundation decide to leave equity out of their statement? Why equity and not inclusion? That's a really interesting question, and I don't have the precise answer because I was out of the room when that decision was taken. Um, but um, Mellon Foundation has been a fairly traditional funder, and sometimes words are so powerful um, that we can effectuate, we can get to the result with that, but not necessarily use the terminology. And I think that it was perhaps a comfort level among the decision makers. Um, we do have a uh, diversity and inclusion task force, and that is now called the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. So stay tuned, check our website in a few months. <laughs> Good. Um, so I do want to encourage the um, audience to ask questions, and I see a question. Awesome. Hi, I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and I want to start by thanking you on behalf of the Sphinx Board for joining us this morning. Um, I'll try to be succinct. So in 2003, um, my charitable foundation launched a project that we call Music by Black Composers, and we've thus far collected more than 900 works by more than 250 composers from all around the world from the 1700s to the present day. Uh, the purpose of this uh, music gathering is to provide books that will be for beginners through advanced students for private instrumental teaching and school music use. And after 15 years of research, we're about to launch our first volume one for violin within the next few months. Uh, we're also, thank you. We're also making this repertoire available to professional performers. Literally right now, if you're a violin teacher in um, any town in America, you've got a student in Suzuki book three, you wanna give them a piece by a black composer, this music is simply not available. Most of it is out of print, a lot of it is in manuscript only. Um, if you're a professional performer and you want to diversify your recital programs, you don't know what repertoire exists or where to find it, and these are exactly the problems that we are addressing. Um, with this, um, well, basically, uh, in the last two years, to get us down the home stretch so that we could finally publish this first volume, um, I've put in about $100,000 personally into the project, which I'm very happy to do. It's involved, you know, rearranging my family's own personal and philanthropic budget. And even though soloists earn a good living, this is simply not sustainable. Um, everybody says that our work is urgently needed, um, but the problem is, the reason it's urgently needed is that nobody has ever done this before. And because nobody has ever done this before, we literally don't fit into any foundation's guidelines. We are providing materials for, for performers, but we are not presenting concerts. We are providing materials for educators, but we are not teaching children. We're making this music available for everybody to inspire black kids, but also to get kid, you know, white kids like my daughter, Asian kids, everybody studying music to diversify their repertoire. So we are not targeting one particular socioeconomic or racial group. We are not limiting our efforts to a particular geographic area or age range. Um, we are doing um, high level work by our PhDs in academic research utilizing primary materials, but our Results are not designated for the academic community. We are also not creating general classroom materials. We're creating materials specifically for music teachers. Um, so this is a huge problem. And we, we were lucky about 10 years ago, we got a one-time um, grant from the Illinois Humanities. Um, and that was because one of the politicians knew me personally and let the fact that we're including a lot of biographical material about the composers in our pages count as humanities, and I got this one grant. Now, of course, my state is bankrupt and likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. Um, I have been, it has been suggested that we alter the scope of our work to fit grant guidelines, but I feel that that would be impractical and frankly irresponsible because our work is very important and very specific. So, um, I almost feel at this juncture, having tried to get grant money for 15 years, 
I almost feel like maybe some organization needs to believe in us enough to literally alter their guidelines to fit what we do, but I'm starting to feel rather panicked at this point, and I'm hoping you guys can help. I'm a former music publisher, so I really sympathize with what this has cost you. Um, and print music is, is a, a challenge, um, but I also believe in the music publishing industry personally, and I'd be very happy to put you in touch with my former colleagues, uh, who I think might be able to help you uh, well, we, we've got a publisher that's all ready to go. It's the, it's the creating of the, the materials to be ready for publication that is um, pricey. Mm -hmm. uh, I would wonder what sort of partners have you looked at as far as, is there somebody that you could combine with an educational mission so that it's, it's, you're reaching a bigger audience and you're tapping into a different, um, uh, just maybe possible funding source, but, but just a different perspective on how you get the word out? Yeah, well, I'm hoping maybe people here at Sphinx this week um, can give me suggestions. We certainly have a number of testing grounds around the country, different programs who are already utilizing our materials with their students, um, but we haven't found that that has enabled us to fit the guidelines for grants, um, despite the fact that those kids are using our materials. So this is actually a good segue into another Slido question, um, which is sometimes the access to your organization is difficult. What are you doing to be more accessible to all size organizations? So can you all talk really briefly about what your process is? So Susan, you said that it's invitation only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to talk a little bit more? Um, um, yeah, we, because we are national, we do have to say no a lot more than we say yes, and uh, we know that there are many, many more worthy organizations than we can possibly fund, despite the size of our organization. Um, our guidelines are on our website, um, our uh, grant making, uh, but uh, it really is a matter of us showing up to places like this, to the service organization conferences, um, and just taking the temperature of the room. Sure. Hi. Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, we are, um, uh, our website is open. Uh, anybody is, is welcome to apply. Uh, we're in the process of changing vendors, so maybe not just yet, but maybe in another few weeks. Um, uh, I think I would also say it's these sort of personal con contacts that would help, um, but also maybe try to think of things in a bigger way, how this fits bigger issues uh, in, in framing your particular interest, and, and, and look and see where we um, what we fund and how we fund and see how you might fit into that. I think that could go a long way towards helping you make your case. Yeah, yeah I would say for us a lot of it just starts with conversations. We, we don't have a process that begins through the website or begins with a letter of inquiry, although sometimes people do send us letters of inquiry and we'll, we'll start a conversation that way. Our process does take some time, particularly for groups that we don't know because we're constantly trying to figure out how various work fits into our strategies, uh, but we're, we're always open to beginning a dialogue and seeing whether there's a good fit for us or not. Thank you. So we are running um, really low on time, and I want to make sure that we get any questions from the audience. So are there other questions? Sorry. Um, I lost my voice a little bit with all the fun yesterday. Um, so hi, hi, my name is Gabrielle Skinner. Um, I'm at Beals Race University currently in my master's. Um, coming into my third year and going into graduation, I've started to really think about self-promotion and entrepreneurial aspects of what my career might become. Because to me, just being in an orchestra is wonderful, but mm -hmm. there's so much more that we can offer. And being at this conference for the second year now really just has expanded my mind mm -hmm. on this kind of aspect. So being a young musician, I'm wondering like, how do we approach grants and what is it that we can do to make our ideas more feasible and supported because I feel like a couple times I've been told that I'm too young to start something and I don't really know how to react to that and where to find that support. Um, I will say that um, most funders are funding to 501c3 organizations or through fiscal sponsors. Um, and uh, we like to say that leadership comes in all sizes and shapes. Uh, we do have a program for, of musician-led ensembles that we've been supporting. Um, it includes the um, ICE and A Far Cry and 
the knights. Uh, and I, I, again, going back to my presentation, we began with the convening, we took the temperature of the room, uh, we realized that, that those organizations didn't feel that they fit into the League of American Orchestras, and we felt that they were modeling practices that were important that uh, American orchestras might take note. You know, the flexibility around programming, rehearsal time diversity in their programming, um, you know, flexibility. Uh, so uh, that's a small program that we created uh, addressing similar kind of needs. Um, but as I say, we get letters over the transoms, e emails over the transoms every day, and um, sometimes we just have to be traffic cops. And we try to be encouraging. We encourage you to go to the service organization meetings um, and find your, find your partners. Right, and actually, if I can continue, what, what sort of things do you look for in these like propositions? Like what, what makes you want to help an ensemble? for example? Well, we're looking to answer a kind of systemic question, and the question in that example was why, can, are there models that are more flexible for making music in, on, in group ensemble? So that was a, a, a question. Um, we simply just can't fund single projects, worthy as they may be, so we work through, we have a number of regranting programs, um, the National Dance Project, the National Theater Project, New York Theater Program, that help us broaden our reach and work with peer um, panels to help us determine um, where the best work is being made because we know we can't get to everything. We have a staff of five in the performing arts. Um, uh, we don't get it right all the time, so that's why we're listening and, and responding best we can. The example I gave in Comprehensive Organizational Health with the International Association of Dance, that began with a meeting that it was a chance encounter at a Dance USA conference with their president, their volunteer president at the time, Denise Thompson, and it was a two-year courtship. Mm -hmm. So don't lose hope, and we keep listening. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank you. And one thing that I will add, um, it's difficult because most uh, foundations don't support individual artists, mm -hmm. but Dodge funds a, a national program called Creative Capital, mm -hmm. which really helps provide professional development and support for individual artists. And you're absolutely right, this notion of an individual artist as an entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. you may want to visit their website, um, and they have some online modules, they have some in-person trainings, but they're a great resource. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. Hi, um, my question is related to just the financial solvency of a lot of the arts institutions that are in the landscape right now, because um, I'm sure that, like, uh, I, my day job is with the Orchestra of St. Luke's, but I also um, run the Dream Unfinished, which is an activist orchestra, and it's a much smaller ensemble. And so I know that there are a lot of other similar smaller ensembles at this very conference and working nationally, but they're also competing with um, legacy organizations, many of which we're seeing in the news that are having major like financial constraints and issues. Mm -hmm. So how do your foundations make these decisions as far as, um, you know, putting funding into an ensemble that may or may not be existing in the next five or 10 years, um, because it seems to really shift from season to season. And this is gonna have to be the last question, and we have a brief amount of time to answer it. Well, I would say, I mean, we, because yeah, we have way more requests than we are able to uh, fulfill. I mean, we do tend to defer to existing partners um, that, that we have known a long time and that have proven and you know certainly are, and are financially healthy. Uh, I guess I don't, I would say don't discount working with them um, and finding some sort of way that you can be a part of an existing relationship but that you advance it in your own unique way. Because we, we do look for, I mean, we, times change, uh, language changes, arts changes, uh, you know, populations change. So we're always, we're, it's incumbent on us to keep up with uh, where things are going. So we're, we're open to new ideas, but, but it's hard if you come through the door and you're an entirely unknown face to us, um, you know, obviously there, that is a steeper climb. So if you can leverage uh, people that we already work with, that, that helps, can, I would say, get in the door. Sandy, you wanna weigh in? Yeah, I mean, we, we also have a challenging time in funding the smaller organizations. Uh, but we, what we try to do is figure out, is there some, particularly because of the focus on diversity, inclusion, and equity, is there a collaborative that we could fund of organizations that are working around those issues where the, there could be, they could be resourced through that collaborative? Trying to find some creative ways to, to structure this. We, we try to do that a lot. But it's also a little challenging in that because we're a global foundation, we have this global 
uh, focus. And then I'm here in Detroit and I'm trying to build a place-based strategy here. Uh, the, the challenges of doing that um, can, can lead to situations where we can't get resources to the smaller groups. But this is why I was saying, uh, if there are local foundations who might be interested in that work and championing it, maybe we could work with them to figure out ways to support uh, an ecosystem of organizations. Um, we make a certain number of high-risk, high-benefit grants, but we have to be careful about those. I would say as a, you know, um, in a just starting out situation to both of the questions that we receive, so you start with friends and family, you do network, you go to other people's shows and concerts, you find out, you introduce yourselves to those boards. I think individual donations are where you are gonna get your initial funding rather than um, national funders at this stage. Um, I'm thinking about my first grant to ICE. It, it came, they came through the door years ago. Um, a, pres a presenter told me that this was just an absolutely phenomenal organization and that recommendation was my first entree into that organization. Um, and I wish you well and uh, just be patient. Well, the clock is our enemy. Time is up <laughs> for this great conversation. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.